you realized how many little pockets of joy there were and little drops of delight. And for me, the sky is always a delight. And I want to talk about today, clouds. And that seems like a very simple subject. You're gonna, not gonna be, uh, well, you're gonna be amazed at how many different types of clouds there are. And then the next time I'll talk about other atmospheric phenomenon, things you may not be aware of, you know, halos, but you may not have ever seen sun dogs or sky pillars or other things like that. And then some clouds that aren't clouds. <laughs> and then the last session, I will talk about two of my favorite topics, auroras and meteorites, because they are obviously phenomena in the sky and we're advancing to a solar maximum again. Uh, it's been quiet for the last eight or nine years, but we're gonna go into uh, a tumultuous time for our sun. And that usually produces very good auroras. All right, I have to go down this probably and get this. Uh, I don't, I can't think of any metaphor used more than clouds. <laughs> and they're used for everything. Of course, it's almost Shakespearean. And think of all the poetry. Uh, it can be used for various incarnations of the soul. And think of all the songs that have clouds in it. And that's one of the reasons I, I love clouds so much because they do speak to me. And I will share some poetry, oh, come on, with you. They can inspire us and they can affect our mood. I'm actually missing clouds. I came in in massive thunderstorms and tornadoes and now it is uh, super high pressure, very hot and there's not a cloud in the sky. And so clouds or lack of them can affect our mood and they're fun to watch. When was the last time you just laid on the beach or the mountaintop and watched the clouds go by. And it understands, it, it enhances, oh, sugar, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm in another farm house, so we'll just have to bear with that. So get up in the clouds, keep your head up in the clouds because they're very, very inspiring. I am gonna delve into a little bit of meteorology, uh, not much. Uh, but I want you to appreciate uh, some of the meteorology that goes into this. This is sunrise on Mars. This is sunrise on Mars. Think about that. And here are these stars, this little constellation, except this constellation doesn't stay like this. Everything moves. So that, if you were looking at it from Mars, that's Earth. And think about this incredible image. I think this is one of the most amazing images ever produced, looking down on our planet. And it is like a blue marble, but notice the clouds, covered with clouds. And this is our atmosphere. That's it. Up to here, maybe 60 miles. Up to that ye little yellow line, that's about 10 miles. So up to there, that's about 30 miles. I used to tell my students that if I rode my bike, which I did all the time to my classes, if I rode it straight up in the air, up in the sky, I would be out of the atmosphere. Here is our atmosphere. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of terms, a lot of big 50 cent, 75 cent words. Don't worry about them. Some of them you know. The lowest level of our atmosphere, called the troposphere, it only goes up about uh, seven or eight miles. It depends where you are on the planet. But this is for vir virtually all of our weather takes place here. And most of the clouds, 99% of the clouds, if you go up a little higher, there's the ozone layer, the stratosphere. This is as high as weather blooms. And then just barely still in our atmosphere is what's called the mesosphere. That's where we see meteorites come through and burn up. And I'll talk about some other things we can see up there. This is a, a, a view from the space station and it's taken from day. This is a daylight picture. So if you're up there right at the edge of the stratosphere, 60 miles up, 
above that, it's dark. <laughs> My brother uh, was building a, a, a rocket plane one time and he was gonna go to, the, to uh, the sun because everyone was trying to get to the moon. And I said, you know, you're gonna burn up, Terry. And he said, oh, that's all right, I got to figure it out. I'm going to go at night. So uh, anyway, he never made it. Uh, but I learned a lot about the troposphere. This is where most of our atmospheric mass is. And most of the water vapor, it's dynamic. And it also is very important for transferring heat from the equator all the way to the poles. And this is part of the function of clouds. They transfer heat. This is a more distant picture. Uh, again, outer space, even if you took this picture at night, uh, during the day, you would see outer space is black and you would see the stars. And if we didn't have an atmosphere, we would see stars all day long. So here's this thin layer and you can see the clouds there. And then Above that is actually the mesosphere. Here's the stratosphere, and this is the transition. Clouds, especially these big storm clouds, can rise all the way to the top of the troposphere, and they can push it up. And this is a thunderstorm, huge thundercloud with there is the tropopause and it's pushing laterally because it's actually pushing the layer of atmosphere to the sides. And this, this is sometimes about as high as planes can fly. So planes like to go around these, they don't like to go over them because that's where you get turbulence. And you can see how big these things are. So this is the one exception where clouds can go all the way to the top of our, our atmosphere. And I love flying at night because and I love flying over tropical regions because you see these massive thunderstorms. Now this is just a layer of what we would call stratus clouds. That's a layer of uh, rain clouds. And then this is the big cell. And then this is what we call an anvil. And this is the top of our atmosphere functionally. Now clouds can form any level and that's important and they don't, stay the same. They change from one form into another. However, they tend to stay at a distinctive altitude. And clouds are nothing but water vapor that has condensed and become liquid. And it is part of our great hydrologic cycle. The ocean evaporates as that vapor rises, it cools and then it falls again when this cloud can't hold anymore or if the temperature drops, it rains. The same thing happens on the land, evaporation plus this function. You know it because if you park under a car, the tree will kind of drip on you. That's called transpiration. It pumps up water, it releases water through its leaves and it goes up into the atmosphere. So this is cycle, the hydrolyte hydrologic cycle. Ah, we'll go. And this is how water is distributed over our planet. Rain moves it in over land and most of our water, almost 98% of our water is salt water. And then if we look at that 2%, 2.5%, less than one, half a percent is in lakes and rivers. More is in uh, the groundwater, but 70% of our fresh water is frozen. Look, Bambi, it's stiff. And that's why we're concerned if this begins to melt, that's gonna put a lot more water into the ocean. It'll go this way, of course. Water gets up into our atmosphere and it stays there maybe a week or two, often just hours in some cases. You can watch it in the tropics. You're laying on a beach in a tropical place, you can see the clouds building up during the day, rains in the afternoon. So this is quite variable. And even in rivers, it barely stays for two weeks and you can see uh, not long thereafter. It's only again in the oceans or in glaciers. So the clouds are incredibly dynamic, not just for moving 
uh, moisture around and shading our planet and absorbing infrared radiation and some of the nasty uh, ultraviolet forms, but it also redistributes the heat and enriches our nitrogen. Lightning is unique because it actually produces a number of things, and I'll talk about lightning as a phenomenon next time, but one of the things it does is it uh, makes nitrogen diatomic, which falls in the rain and actually works as a fertilizer. And the clouds drive the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, even the sulfur cycle. So these, this is a geodynamic importance of the clouds. Now vapor cannot condense without some sort of condensation nuclei, dust, dust particle. Uh, there are physical reasons for this, but this is what we sometimes call a seed. Planes still fly and produce iodine dust that water vapor will condense on. Seeding is done, by the way, quite commonly in California because so much depends upon our snow. So if there's a storm coming through, there are planes um, that are flown into the storms to drop iodine seeds so that there'll be nuclei particles. Water uh, aggregates on this, gets bigger and bigger, and then eventually forms drops. The dust particles are incredibly small. And some of this is actually cosmic dust, stuff left over from the Big Bang, from ex nova, different novae that uh, produced all this cosmic dust that rains down on us, meteor dust. Also, uh, kind of exhalations from sulfur uh, producing plankton, mineral dust, fun fungal scores. If you look in a cloud, it's actually an ecosystem. There's bacteria living up there. Also the organic compounds um, like polycarbons and uh, ammonia and things also are very important. When a drop is condensed on a nucleus, it falls, it aggregates with other drops and gets bigger and bigger. And you've noticed your own experiences. Sometimes raindrops get very, very big. A similar pro process occurs with snow. It needs a nuclei, uh, but the water particles join and because of the geometry of water, it will form some sort of hexagonal structure. How do clouds form? Well, they need this condensation, lifting of air. And one of the best ways to do that is for clouds to go over a mountain. I love this. Doesn't take much of a mountain for clouds to form. This is called orographic uplift. Also, if there is hot air rising, thermals, think of the Central Valley, deserts, hot air rising, it will cool. There's distinctive rates that water cools and it will condense. You can also have fronts, a warm air mass rising up over a cold front, or you can have, again, uh, a different kind of lift. And then you also can have convergence. This is an example also of convergence. I love this. This is one of my favorite little islands in the Faroes. <laughs> it just forms a little uh, beanie on top of this island. Now, here's a wonderful, uh, interesting man who was a chemist. Uh, he opened up big pharmaceutical companies way back in the day, uh, Luke Howard. But he was very interested in science as well as chemistry. And he would watch clouds and he painted clouds. And he wrote an essay for the, uh, the Royal Society on the modification of clouds. And he came up with the terminology of clouds. And he was, you could actually name each of these different clouds because he saw them and he named them. Fundamentally, using Howard's classification, there are puffy white masses, cotton balls, which are called cumulus. And it, it sort of is like cotton balls. If there's a layer, a stratum like geology, a low sheet or layer, that's called a stratus or stratus cloud. And then there's these wispy, feathery clouds way, way up in the upper troposphere. And those are called cirrus. If it's raining, then we use 
the additional term nimbus. Stratus and nimbus, or stratus and cumulus are basically the only two that rain because cirrus are so high up, they're frozen crystals of ice. Now, of course, it's not that simple because you can have different clouds at different levels. So much of the meteorological observations have to do with the type of cloud and where it is. If it's a low cumulus cloud, it, and if it's by itself, it just may be called cumulus. If it's a layer, it's stratocumulus. If the cumulus is high, it will, or relatively high, it will be called alto cumulus. And if it's really, really high, which is possible, although the, the moisture up there will be frozen, these are called serocumulus. So combining all these, you get 10 fundamental types of clouds. And uh, don't worry about memorizing these. You can download apps. This is, you know, whatever it is, 2021. You can download an app for this. You can take a picture of the cloud and the app will tell you what you're looking at. You know, just, you can, there's an app for birders. You just point it, hear the song, and the app tells you what bird's singing. What fun is that? I don't know. But so here's a cumulo, big, huge cumulus going all the way up, but it's raining. So it's a cumulonimbus. Here is a big blanket nimbostratus. But you can have simple cumulus way down here in the atmosphere, or stratus, or stratocumulus. At the middle elevations, altostratus, altocumulus. And at the very top, you can have these ice wispy clouds and cirrostratus and even cirrocumulus. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It sounds like Latin, but it is. So it's okay. We'll go on because it gets even more complicated because the British love complications. And I want to reiterate again that what kind of cloud you are looking at depends on your altitude. I love flying because I just study the clouds and I take pictures all the time. Uh, here's a mid-level alto stratus and then high up this kind of more uh, feathery cirro stratus. It's a layer, so it's a layer of, of stratus clouds. And this is about where airlines, airplanes or jets will fly. This is about 35,000 feet, depending on where you are. So high clouds like cirrus, which are feather-like, but you can have puffy cumulus up there, but they'd be called cirrocumulus and not really gonna rain, except if you get the top of a thunderstorm. So these are some of uh, my favorite clouds because they're, they foretend something gonna happen. <laughs> uh, most people call these mare's tails, Cirrus, you notice they can, depending on where you are, they can be at the tropopause 45, 50,000 feet. That is quite high. And it is possible to get these incredible mackerel or sometimes called buttermilk skies. These are puffy cirrus or cumulus clouds, but they haven't formed a dense layer yet, uh, probably because the wind is moving pretty rapidly but they're so high, they're probably up at 30,000 feet. So you would call them cirrocumulus. And they're very, very pretty. How do you know if they're up that high? <laughs> well, there's certain tricks. <laughs> uh, these are, may have been cumulus at one time, but now they're layered. This is in between and nothing is all that straightforward. This still seems a little bit like mare's tails. This still see, seems a little bit like uh, mackerel sky, but now you can see definite layer forming. So this is cirrostratus. This is Svalbard, Norway, and this is cirrus stratus, a layer of this. And when you see this and you see down here, it's even more dense. Generally, this means there is a big change in the weather coming. So, uh, and these often make really beautiful sunsets because they're so high, they're the last thing in the sky to catch any of the sun's light. Also, Cirrus is so high and so frozen 
that uh, the ice crystals often produce this, this halo. And sometimes a, a kind of moonbow or even sunbow. We'll talk about halos uh, at another time. But you can see a little bit of the refraction giving you some color in there. So the inner edge of the halo will show some red. And if it, you can barely make out a little bit of bluish on the outside. So that's just sun refracting through the ice crystals. Medium clouds, which are usually designated with alto, not quite super high, but alto stratus, alto cumulus. And so you can combine all these. You can have alto cumulus, mid-level clouds, anything from about 5,000 to 20,000 feet. You can have a layer alto stratus. And then you also can have these lower clouds, just simple cumulus, big cumulo nimbus, you see the ring, and stratocumulus. And these things will change back and forth, especially during rainstorms. So this is mid-level. This also looks like a mackerel sky, but it's not as high. It's maybe only half as high as cirrocumulus. So very, very dense. And this is another kind of alto uh, cumulus. This is distinctive because it almost looks, well, it's undulating and there are meteorological reasons for this kind of undulation. Often it has to do with layers of uh, different layers of different temperatures uh, of air that are moving in different directions and with different densities. So they can actually create ripples in the sky, if you will. I'm going to go back to here. Come on. Alto stratus. This looks like it's going to rain, doesn't it? And quite a lot of West Coast rain is alto stratus. Uh, in the east and in the Midwest, you often get very big cumular buildups. So uh, I hate to say this, but California is a little bereft of some dramatic clouds unless you go up to the Sierra Nevada or unless you live in Shasta City. Here is a whole stratus of actually to me looks like snow clouds. This especially looks like snow clouds. And you can also see a little bit of a halo, but not a distinctive coloration because this is not ice. So you're not going to get that uh, kind of rainbow halo around this. And there's a certain designation. It's still translucent because you can see the sun through it. And this is kind of another unwaving uh, alto stratus called undulatus. And this also is produced by turbulence uh, and temperature inversions. So the low level clouds, the ones that most people are familiar with, the ideal kid cloud is a cumulus. If it's a lazy layer or maybe fog, that is a stratus. If it's big, puffy and builds up, that is a stratocumulus. And if it's raining, it's nimbus or nimbostratus. And these are delightful. As Wal Ralph Waldo Emerson said, these are the daily bread for the eyes. These beautiful puffy clouds rolling like sheep, like any kind of metaphor you wanna use uh, across the landscape. And if it heats up, if there's more moisture in the ground, these will turn into big cumulonimbus later. But quite often these just mean fair weather. More fair weather clouds. Sometimes it's just fun to watch the clouds slowly dancing to nowhere, but with everywhere to go. Aren't these incredible over the Midwest? Now, Howard and other scientists weren't happy with a sort of genus of clouds. They began, like uh, Linnaeus, to designate types of species of clouds. So it is a Linnaean system. Uh, and this is quite formalized, and there's initials for this. But 
if you have this very simple kind of humble, these are cumulus. If they're getting a little bit top heavy, then they're mediocre, but that's all right. But if they go way up, then they are congestus. And if they go so high, they're up at the troposphere. They're, and it's probably raining down here. That is cumulonimbus. So here is uh, probably an undulating form of cumulus that have just kind of coalesced into a, a thin layer. They probably won't produce much rain. There's not enough uh, cooling to have this happen. But if it keeps building up, and this is what it would look like underneath, you see there's, there's a potential for rain, especially late in the afternoon. So this is a stratus, and this is what look, we see a lot in California, but very low stratus. In fact, it's hard to separate, is this fog or are these clouds? But what you miss, <laughs> and maybe you don't want to miss these, are these incredible thunderheads that go up to uh, 50,000 feet and develop interesting structures in them. This is a very distinctive structure here called an arc. And you can see this rain coming down. You see that little bit blip there? Uh, you watch that, that could easily develop into a tornado. In the arid Southwest or in deserts around the world, you get these congested uh, piled cumulus that will rain very quickly. And you see the squall lines, that's rain off in the distance. And these spread and move very quickly and they can even uh, turn into huge cyclones. And we wouldn't have these tremendous sunsets if we didn't have cloudy skies. And here's another nimbus congested up there, same here. And sometimes the rain is very, very localized. <laughs> Uh, even out in the desert. Sometimes the rain is incredibly localized. And here is this kind of uh, uh, wannabe cumulus cloud. And he says, I think I can, I think I can, and has enough moisture, it, it makes a little downpour. And you notice it's much higher than all the others. And sometimes even the stratus will have a huge downpour. So heavy clouds, like heavy hearts are best relieved by letting out a little water or sometimes a lot of water. Uh, in these complicated congested cumulus, you sometimes get a water bomb or a rain bomb. <laughs> and it literally lands. This is a shot from Australia. This is up in Scotland. Bam. <laughs> it's, uh, you would call it a cloud, cloud burst, but you can actually, if you're distant, you can see these microbursts. And if you're under there, that is tremendous wind gusts coming. Uh, and this, this is strong enough to actually take an airplane out of the sky or <laughs> it can destroy Phoenix. This is a massive rain bomb over Phoenix a few years ago. Most people will never get to see anything like that. So there are 10 fundamental clouds. And if you, you know, the cirrus, the cumulus and the stratus, but you can combine these. So you have zero stratus and so on. And nimbus just means it's raining. Uh, you can uh, actually get an electronic copy of this. I put the, this in the hand, handout. And the World Meteorological Organization, they have all kinds of uh, charts that you can download, identification keys, and also, I think they now have this as a digital format. Yes, a PDF format, the International Cloud Atlas, which is just chock-a-block with all kinds of information. Now, the International Cloud Atlas recently <laughs> uh, identified 11 new clouds. Wow, uh, they're not happy with what they have. So, uh, and you'll see that some of these are distinctive. So now there aren't just 10 basic clouds, you can get 11 additional basic clouds. And these are asparagus clouds, toil and thunder. And they are just frightening when you see them. It's a form of stratus with turbulence going through it. Uh, they make for amazing photographs. Uh, and 
It's fluid dynamics. You can watch this and you can see how this is real time. So you just get mesmerized. You think the end is nigh watching these asparagus clouds just, and they're not thick. They're just rolling turbulent uh, with all sorts of ripples and so on. Sometimes they turn into rain clouds, but we'll see these later. Oops, there. Now, this is a very strange kind of cloud. <laughs> it's one of the new designations. It's called a cavum. It means a cave in the clouds. It has an older name called fall streak. And they puzzled people for a long time. You have any idea what could cause this to happen? I'll give you a little hint. Whoops, where is it? Well, I'll, we'll come back to it later. This is also turbulence. Say you may have uh, cold here and warm here, and this warm is moving very, very rapidly, and you actually create waves in the cloud and you get this turbulence. And these are called fluctus or Kelvin Holtz turbulence clouds. They're very beautiful. They're usually in the middle altitudes, sometimes even in low altitudes with stratus clouds with an inversion above that. These are, <laughs> well, I love to see these, but uh, most people don't. This is the bottom of a massive cumulus cloud. And what happens is you get this wall. Uh, there's actually a downdraft in here because everything else is going up like this. There's rain up here, but this is dropping out of the cloud and you get this wall or murus cloud. And they can look very frightening sometimes. Uh, here is the wall cloud coming down. You often have a leading tail, a lot of rain in front of this lightning. And you almost think that something is gonna happen here. Uh, and it often does. The wall cloud can come down all the way to the bottom uh, and it can begin to rotate. Now remember, this is downdraft. This is cold. The wind is going out like this. It's strong enough. It can be 80, 100 miles an hour coming down out of this. And you might guess what else can come down out of this. So these are wall clouds and capable of tremendous downpours. And you see the rotation. There's actually a counter rotation here, if you notice this. Not something you want to fly into. Another cloud that's associated with these massive cumulonimbus, you can see a wall cloud back there, is what is called a, a caudal cloud or a tail cloud. They extend forward like this. And because there's an awful lot of turbulence and uplift here, you get lightning. But that's the tail cloud going out there. There's also a rear tail cloud. There's the wall cloud. And if you look carefully, you can see that a tornado did form in there. And this is the tail cloud. And this thunderstorm is just massive. Now, in this kind of com complex supercell, you get downdraft where the wall often forms and you get updrafts, both sides. Uh, you can get moisture bed getting trapped in there and that's usually what forms hail, but you can have uh, this extending out, riding over the updraft there. And so there you see the, the rain field, uh, the rain free base, but this is what can happen. This is what can create an arc. And it looks like some great sci-fi <laughs> monster coming at you. Uh, and it moves quite fast. And your hair will crackle, there'll be lightning around, but, and this will have both updrafts and downdrafts. And they look frightening and they often engulf cities. This is an interesting one out at sea off Australia because this is dust. <laughs> this is red dust from uh, the outback in Australia. But these things often, uh, these arc clouds come down and look like they're just gonna swallow or vacuum up the city. 
and there usually is a massive thunderstorm that follows us. Here is a, a kind of tame cloud that has recently been named, and that is waterfalls, which, which create uh, droplets that condense very quickly and form their own little clouds. Now, it seems insignificant, but they're worthwhile naming because scientists like to name things. So here's cataract generated or waterfall generated clouds. And sometimes they can persist and become quite significant, but we like them too because they will create rainbows. Even mountains, especially in the summer, when they are transpiring, when they are pumping water through the roots, up the branches, out to the leaves or needles, and they open up their little pores and out come not only water vapor, but these very complex aromatic compounds uh, and sticky saps. And that itself is capable of generating clouds. And so here is the Great Smoky Mountains, well named because it isn't just smoke, it is actually a uh, kind of pollution in a way. So there can be regular alto stratus clouds up here, but here is the forest generated cloud and rainforests are really capable of doing this because there's so much rain. This is in the Amazon. And of course, we can ignore, and may, maybe some of you have noticed how rare these clouds are. Uh, these, these are called homo mutatus, <laughs> otherwise known as contrails. Uh, I love this image because it's, uh, these are two Soviet MiGs and these are two F-115s way above the troposphere, fighting just at the base of the mesosphere. Uh, and of course, leaving a tremendous contrails up there. Their gas and their, well, their avi aviation gas comes out, condenses in the cold air, uh, and initially comes out depending on how many engines you have. You may have four of these, you may have two of these, and then they coalesce and then they dri dribble off. And if there's high winds, they spread. And you can actually get complete cirrostratus cir clouds from contrails forming. Uh, I remember 9-11 because I stopped and looked up in the sky and there were no contrails and I knew something was weird uh, because that never happens. Also, after 9-11, without the contrail cloud cover, we had a measurable cooling of the planet because this increased cloud cover from contrails would trap the heat from the planet. So uh, it would warm up. And of course, they're not contrails, they're chemtrails. Don't you know your government is up there spraying chemicals to sterilize people and more recently, viruses to infect them. People in the know know that COVID is a government conspiracy sprayed by special jets way up in the atmosphere. And to make this even more <laughs> current, 5G. These antenna, which are attached to the ground, have been seen by people in England and elsewhere, take off at night and spray viruses over the world. Consequently, people in England are shooting 5G antenna and blowing them up. Anyway, nonsense. but. Uh, there are enough people who believe it. And when you look up and you see all of this, is it just all these planes? Yeah, yes it is. And we do generate pollution. This is generated by people, homogenitus. Uh, these are hot springs, these are power plants. This is a, a pulp mill. And also some of you have seen these clouds, unfortunately. This one was actually from last summer. Uh, this is Mono Lake, by the way. And this is a big one on the east side. That's Tanaya Canyon right there. Not Tanaya, uh, but uh, Virginia Lakes over here. And one feature that goes with uh, forest fires and other is you can get so much uplift 
and spiraling, you get a little miniature storm and you can get fire tornadoes. Look how uh, integral that is. It's amazing. And they go way up and they can wander and create more fires. Clouds can tell us what the weather is because they, pre, uh, they are a front of the weather. So if you see high cirrus, it may mean nothing, or it may mean if you see cirrostratus behind it, that this is a warm front climbing up over cold air and you'll get alto stratus and then way behind that nimbo stratus. So this is why if you're up in the mountains and you see a cloud like this, oh, well, it's very likely in a day we will get rain or snow. They're indicators. This is another way this can happen in reverse. Uh, there's another warm front going way up to the tropopause and spreading this way. So if you see cirrus and then uh, cirrostratus, uh, you may expect a big cumulonimbus coming up behind it. Cumulus clouds often will progress through various stages, a little humble, little one, a mediocre one, then a congested one, then this massive cumulus nimbus with an anvil and so on, and then it breaks apart. So clouds go through a, a succession of shapes depending on what kind of weather they're transmitting. Here again, these are big cumulonimbus with an anvil right at the top, but you still see stratocumulus and altocumulus down here. But this is all the way up at the tropopause. Sometimes it punches through too. It can push the tropopause ahead of it. And you don't want to fly over these <laughs> because there's huge amounts of, uh, you think about the Bernoulli effect. If you put your finger on the end of the watering hose, the air will just be speeding over that. And these are beautiful clouds and congested, but down here you have rain and you also have some stratus and some alto stratus along the ed edges. One of the rarest clouds and very, very few people have ever seen these because it takes a very distinctive cumulus cloud uh, that has well formed into a supercell where you get this middle downdraft and this would probably have a wall cloud. And then you have a arc cloud coming over this. And sometimes the arc cloud gets caught in the warm inflow and it rolls up like a carpet and then it's pushed off. So this probably was an arc cloud from a big, huge thunderstorm, but separated and just rolled off as a, what is called the roll cloud. And you can see how this might happen. And they are very strange to see uh, can happen at, at, at sea as well as land. So we go back to the thunderstorm, this huge cumulonimbus that's congested all the way. Here's a wall cloud with a tornado coming through. This is a wall cloud with huge amounts of precipitation. And this would be called the shelf cloud and in front would be a shelf cloud. But way up here, and if you see these, these are actually one of my favorite clouds, but if you see these ahead uh, or following cirrus clouds, then be careful because these are indicative of a big thunder cell and potential tornadoes following behind, very close. They're called mammatus. They look uh, like mammary glands and they're very smooth and capable of changing very quickly. And they're also very beautiful. Uh, sunset will make them beautiful, or if you're like this, this is even more ominous. Now, the thunderstorm is actually a miniature cyclone. And quite often it forms in part from the jet stream. And the jet stream is a high altitude uh, kind of river of air. And it's at the top of the tropopause. And it often comes down like this across the United States. And when it does this, it actually creates a vortex, uh, or excuse me, like this. <laughs> and this vortex is actually a high pressure because it is clockwise circulation. Then when it makes a curve like this, it creates an inflow 
or anti-clockwise, and this is a low pressure or cyclonic. This also means that you often have frontal systems. This is looking down on it. So here would be a high pressure sweeping over to a low pressure. And the low pressure means that everything's going to rise and become unstable. High pressure, everything's going to dis descend. And that's why they read millibars all the time. Because if the air is rising, if you take a barometric pressure here, it's going to be very low. If you take the biometric pressure here, everything dropping down on you, it's going to be very high. And this will generally indicate stable weather. But if you get this, it's unstable. And this can happen from occluded fronts, a cold and a warm front meet and they stall. And so you get this cyclonic circulation, which will mean moist rising air. And so here we go again, uh, a little distinctive cumulus. Uh, developing to congest this, really congest this, and then into this massive uh, nimbus stage where you will have downdrafts and tornadoes. Uh, you almost get a kind of an eye in here, not, not this, the way you get with big, huge hurricanes, but it is very similar. And in fact, uh, the tropopause at this point will actually drop because so much air is coming down out of this. So this is a cross section of what is called a supercell. And here is the uplift, which creates the low pressure. But once it gets up here and cools, it sinks. So you can have this uh, downdraft here with very heavy rain. And if water is taken up here and then caught and brought down, taught, taken back up, up, oh, no, back down, up, then you get hail forming. And you can have rain falling from this part, but it doesn't reach the ground. So that's called virgin rain, virga. This <laughs> is not vir virgin rain. This is a full-blown tube cloud or tornado with a downpour around it. And this is now fully rotating and moving probably around 60 to 80 miles an hour across the landscape. Uh, and because this is an updraft, uh, it, when it goes over a house, it doesn't blow up the house, it implodes the house. Everything goes in because suddenly the pressure in the house is different than here and it's going to squash it. Does, you're not going to worry whether oh, you were killed by an implosion or an explosion. It's deadly either way. And these can wander around, go back up, reform and so on. You will never see this. Uh, this is the wonder of computers. This is a, a composite of time lapse. So this is all the same tornado, <laughs> just with time lapse. So that's where it touched down, uh, jumped off, touched down again, got stronger. Uh, and actually increased the torque on value as it went on and became almost like a, a full-blown uh, cyclone. Now, you hear the term tornado alley, <laughs> which varies. Uh, it's often right through the central part of the US, uh, just west of the Mississippi Valley, and then also into Louisiana, Alabama, and parts of Florida, and then it often can get generated up into the northern Midwest. And the reason for that is because quite often this time of the year in the spring, the jet stream wanders like this. This is called the meridional flow. That's why you always need to know where the jet stream is. And the Weather Channel sometimes shows you where the jet stream is. If this jet stream were here, we would be getting the rain and that, that happens. If this jet stream was up here, uh, that would be the Arctic vortex. So just imagine all this upper atmosphere is moving this way. You're gonna get a high pressure here. You're gonna get all the warm air from the Gulf and from Mexico pulled up here. This is cold from the Arctic and dry. It's going to, 
push up the, the warm air here. And so you're gonna get tornadoes formed one after the other. And this spring has been really interesting. One after the other, after the other, down here, one after the other, after the other. And hopefully, I mean, I flew across the last one right here. Uh, this was in a line going up this way. So you can also get the same thing at, at sea. And I've seen more water spouts and I've seen land tornadoes, but, and they're really fun because generally you can outrun them. <laughs> and they're not long lived, uh, but it is very exciting. Now, I ought to stop there, but I got to make it a little complicated just simply because those Brits wouldn't leave well enough alone. So they took the Linnaean nomenclature. So there are genera of clouds, stratus, cumulus, cirrus, but there are species. They also have varieties. <laughs> and now they also have supplementary features. So a cloud fully described will have four attached names. And of course, when you're recording this, you use the uh, abbreviations. So here are some varieties, and I don't want you to worry, worry too much. I talked about undulatus, which meant going like this, translucidus, uh, just barely see the sun, uh, opacus, can mask, and so on. This is a ver vertebratus, which it actually just looks like a backbone, doesn't it? And in addition, well, we've already talked about a lot of these, but I want to show you some examples. This is a stratus deck, really stratus cumulus. And then this is a stratus, cirrostratus up here and a couple of contrails. But there are all these supplementary features. I keep talking about anvils and mamatus clouds. Uh, and these are slightly different, but uh, here's Berga. This means it's not hitting the ground. You see this mostly in the West where the ground is so hot and dry, uh, it will evaporate the rain before it ever hits. But nonetheless, you can still see a rain squall up there. And if you would fly through that, it would be quite turbulent because there are tremendous downdrafts. Well, even little clouds, little tiny cumulus clouds, uh, the little humble, Cumulus, cumulus may actually have rain. And you see this rain is falling, but it's hitting some sort of wind shear here. And here it's rain. And I love the fact that you get these incredible jellyfish clouds that just drift and people have never seen them. Uh, and sometimes uh, if they're high enough, you get a little bit of rainbow or ice crystals forming in them. So. This is virgin rain. It's never going to hit the ground. Uh, and you get a kind of jellyfish formation. And people swear up and down that they are, in fact, angels visiting. Uh, and why not? The clouds are the robes of the angels anyway. And many people talk about these. And we mentioned Callum before, these fall streak holes, which in a in way looks like rain. This almost looks like a rain in some, but uh, here you have an ice bow up in, or what would be called a fire bow way up there. And here is a fire bow. It means that these are probably ice crystals. Now, why do you think these formed? They're cava. That means they're little caves in the clouds. This is a little <laughs> hint. This is an aerial view of a uh, turboprop military plane taking off, punching through a stratus deck. And when they create this turbulence, the air goes like this and the cloud, the moisture freezes. And if it freezes, it gets less dense and it tends to fall. It tends to fall out as ice crystals. So everywhere you see this, a plane went through there. Look at this. This is an airstrip in Israel. These are different takeoffs from, I forget, uh, I think this is in Melbourne, where you get all these different planes taking off different directions. 
And here is one where a jet went through the stratus clouds for quite a ways uh, and just froze a hole in it. Some airports, I used to fly in and out of Salt Lake all the time and sometimes in Churchill, uh, they would just actually release iodine over the airstrip and it would cause uh, snow to fall and they would brush it up and you would have a square over in the clouds over the airstrip, a giant man-made fall streak. Uh, sometimes you see things you just can't figure out. <laughs> That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I've never seen it described. It looks like a reverse fall streak. And it may have been that something went through a hole and is pushing these ice crystals up. But that's a stratus deck, a very low stratus cumulus deck. I love mountains. And hence, this is one of the ways I got interested in clouds because you don't never want to get caught climbing. These all happen to be Manaporns, not too far from where my, father, my mother's family is from, but mountains make their own clouds because some of these are right up at the troposphere. And so you can get a little banner cloud, almost like a uh, flag forming. So you see this, but also, and sometimes if this banner breaks loose, it may uh, tumble down like this. But the most interesting cloud is if you get wind above the mountain going like this, you will get either cap clouds. Well, this is right on the mountain. You get what are called pileus or cap clouds here. But if they're higher up, a little, not much, maybe a thousand feet, you get these. They look like they're lens shaped. And so they're called lenticular clouds. And because they're high up, they often catch the sunset really well. And because they're high up and driven by altitude winds, they blow off and they drift across the country and they're illuminated and they look just like flying saucers. And many, many people will report these flower, flying saucers. Uh, sometimes they, so they'll break loose and they look like they're stacked up. This is down in Brazil. And this is an incredible picture of Fuji, where you just have a lenticular stacked on top of each other. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is in southern Spain in the Grenada area. And these are the original Sierra Nevada, which just means snowy mountain, by the way. And these are pictures of shot from, I shot on the east side of the Sierra Nevada. This isn't too far from Bodie. This is near Mono Lake but these are lenticulars stacked up, broke loose and are drifting across Nevada. If there's no mountain there, but you have a cumulus congested cloud, you can get lenticulars or cap clouds forming on the top at the tropopause of these clouds and they can break a loop and blow, blow away. So you see them right there. So this is actually a cap cloud there. And you also get cap clouds on volcanic eruptions and uh, explosions. So here are a couple of cap clouds very high up, again, at the tropopause. And this is one of my favorites. It, uh, anyone recognize it? One of the great vortex spots of North America in the world. This is little people live here underground in caves. This is Mount Shasta with a cap cloud on it, but it's also a great place to see lenticulars in the winter. So this is probably four o'clock in the afternoon in December or something like that. And this is also what happens. These lenticulars can blow away uh, and just make a whole field of that people swear is an alien invasion about to happen. And sometimes these can dissipate and elevate because often they're formed very, very high up. And this then becomes a kind of a cirro lenticular and they're full on ice crystals, they're frozen. And so you get iridescence. This is known technically as iridescent clouded uh, at the tropopause. If you have a strained situation where there's wind blowing this way, and you have an inversion. There's an inversion here, the wind's blowing this, 
and the air circulates like this, comes up to the inversion and cools and you get clouds and you form streets. And they're one of the more majestic things, not many people get to see them, but uh, you can form massive long streets. They're fun to fly over. Uh, my brother was a glider. He never made it to the moon or the sun, but we used to glide all the way from Pennsylvania down to Kentucky and elsewhere. And we would glide on these because you could ride this up updraft and cross over to this updraft and go all the way down like that, cross over and come back this way on a glider, big glider, I mean. So here's the wind this way, you get uh, updrafts and then downdrafts and you get clouds forming like this and they blow away and just form these long streets. I had a friend uh, who studied vultures in Africa and he noticed the same thing. He took a little motorized glider and followed these giant griffins. Uh, they would do a thermal, catch the cloud street, fly down to a next one, go up, catch the next one, and so on. And they could fly over 200 kilometers uh, by doing this. Some cloud streaks are enormous. They come off of uh, really super cold areas and then hit warm areas. This is Greenland. Uh, this is uh, Baffin's Bay. And this is a kind of extension of uh, the Gulf Stream. So it's warm and so you get the same things. This is on the other side of Greenland. This is Svalbard, north of Norway, the Norwegian Sea down here. And you get these long, this is the East Coast, by the way, that's Chesapeake Bay. And uh, no, that's Chesapeake Bay, sorry, Cape May. Now we're more familiar <laughs> with low clouds. Uh, and if the visibility is less than a kilometer, and I know no one's going to say, oh my goodness, how can you tell if that's a kilometer? Well, you can't see very far. So that's left. You can't, you can barely see a kilometer there. So then it's a fog. All right. If the visibility is greater, then it's a mist. And then you sort of have the in between, a kind of Italian fog, which is called the bigamist, but that's another story. So this is a bigamist in Norway. Actually, uh, yeah, so this is a mist and this is probably caused by the difference in temperature uh, because this is a fjord coming off of uh, a, a branch of the Gulf Stream. So it actually is warmer than the surroundings. So you get a mist, a sea fog or sea mist forming. Oh, come on. Now, in California, there are a number of fogs, of course. You can have advective fog and then trying to get over a mountain uh, and it may not make it. And you can also have frontal fog when you have a warm going over cold air. So if you have a wind pushing up uh, relatively warm air over cold water, like the coast of California, then you're gonna get fog and it will go over the mountain and it might, it will heat up as it goes up over the mountain. It may not make it. In elsewhere, think of the Central Valley. In the winter, it's rained and you get very moist, wet ground. And then at night, it gets cold and the water vapor trapped right by the ground condenses. And night after night, you get fog forming and climbing higher and higher, but you have air, warm air pushing down. So you have an inversion trapping this radiation or as they call it in California, Thule fog, because it will form over the, uh, the marshes, the Central Valley marshes. So this is what we usually get. The coast of California actually has a current called the Alaska current that comes down, comes like this. And because Coriolis uh, works on anything moving on our planet because the planet's moving underneath it, this water is pushed off to the right. And since this water is pushed off, it has to be replaced. So along our coast, we have Coriolis deflected water 
and cold water coming underneath it to replace it. This is cold upwelling. So you can see this on a satellite image. Here's the coast of California. And all that blue is cold upwelling water. And you look out here, and that's warm water and even hotter water. So if the wind is blowing in like this, you get very hot air suddenly hitting cold water. And what's going to happen? You get advective coastal fog, and it will string feed through Golden Gate. There it is. There's Golden Gate. And head directly toward Albany and Point Richmond. So you can tell me exactly what time of the year this is. When's foggy in San Francisco? Ah, the coldest winter, said Mark Twain, was one summer I spent in San Francisco. There it is. What? July. That's a July picture of coastal California. We love it because we get fog almost any time of the year, right? And it makes it so beautiful. Uh, I love the fog. And you can tell, you know, if it's really hot in the Central Valley, if it warms up to like 105 degrees, which is not uncommon, you're going to get an onshore breeze. It's going to pull that fog in. Uh, and then it will try to get inland, but it's going to burn off. So you have a fog going in and out, especially uh, in San Francisco. These are called combers coming off uh, uh, the San Bruno Mountains. You can see some of it going in like this. And this is what the Thule fog or the radiation fog looks like. This is what month? Dead of winter. And there it is, the soup <laughs> all along the Central Valley. If you go up to the mountains, it's beautiful. You know? uh, and this is actually quite light because you, don't, you see there's not a whole lot of snow up there, but you get this very lovely kind of effect. You can have incredible fog tsunamis that just roll in. And uh, if you live in uh, or did, uh, played at Stinson Beach, you could see these coming across Mount Tamalpais. Unfortunately, too, if you're in a valley and it's cold and you get this fog down here, you will get hot air up here and hot sinking air because the mountains heat up and then that air sinks down. This is Little Cottonwood Canyon. <laughs> uh, this is why you escape what we call, what we used to call nuclear winter in Salt Lake City. Uh, so you escape, go up and ski, but you have to drive back down into that at night. And you get this in Los Angeles and you get this in Colorado to some degree. Now I mentioned the World Meteorological Association. They do publish the Cloud Atlas uh, and all sorts of interesting uh, information. They do have a World Meteorological Day. We just missed it. Uh, uh, I got a tornado on that day, so I was very happy and celebrated that. There is also a series of books to teach yourself about clouds, and these are published by Prater Penny, who was one of the founders of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Now you can not only teach yourself the cloud, you can record every cloud you see and then submit them. So if you uh, get to a certain number of clouds, you qualify as a cloud watcher and then a cloud spectator and then a cloud expert and so on. It's like birding. Uh, how many life birds have you accumulated? But this is for clouds and the English are, are I mean, this is typical. I mean, they, they watch trains, they watch airplanes, they're train spotters and do all sorts of things. Um, their reputations to be made. But you can get, if you get so many clouds, you can get a pin, you can get a patch or buy yourself a t-shirt and a beautiful, beautiful calendar or bumper. Uh, Cloud Appreciation Society is really fun. Uh, you can download their app, which is really good. It shows you everything that I've showed you. Uh, uh, there's also, a, of course, a Google app store that gives you all of these. But you know, you can become a cloud spotter. And who wouldn't want to be a member of the Cloud Appreciation Society? Now, 
they have inspired us metaphorically, poetically, and emotionally, and of course, artistically. And I could go on and on and on, but I just want to hit upon a few. Gustave de Dior, who was an incredible engraver, and uh, of course, put the, the angels up in the clouds, and we've always assumed heavens in the clouds. John Constable, who was one of the great influencers of the Hudson School uh, of painters and this idyllic bucolic landscapes, beautiful clouds, early 1800s. And of course, who can forget these clouds and this starlight? He painted this in his, uh, in his room in the institution. He did over 21 paintings from the window. <laughs> Uh, and you can almost look at these clouds and know what he was painting. But he also did other kinds of clouds and he was mesmerized by them. And I think he put his full emotions into these kinds of clouds. I think he probably did uh, these Kelvin Helmholtz clouds. They must have really affected him. And of course, the great uh, American master, George O'Keefe, who moved from Pennsylvania, New York, down to uh, New Mexico and was fascinated by the giant clouds down there. One of her most famous, of course, is the sky above the clouds. She did a series of cloud paintings. This is an enormous one. This is huge. Um, it's in the George O'Keefe Museum in uh, Santa Fe. But she also did some pretty uh, stormy clouds. These are some of my favorite paintings by uh, <coughs> Good, uh, I can't even think of his name. Uh, from Utah, these are all in the Brigham Young uh, Museum. And he had a, a studio just outside of, uh, don't tell me, Zion. So these are typical Western cumulus clouds. These are stratus clouds. This of course is a cumulonimbus, another nimbus. Someone you may not know, but I appreciate because uh, he was a traveler, an adventurer, a uh, painter, and an engraver, uh, Rockwell Kent. And very early on, like in the early 1900s, he made it to Greenland, spent a lot of time in Greenland. And you notice up here, look at that, lenticulars. So you can actually tell what he was looking at. There are some modern painters, may not be your cup of tea, uh, Aaron is uh, very well known. Uh, she lives, works in Arizona. Graham Gherkin also works now in Colorado. He was actually from Nova Scotia. Uh, Bill Hawkins, very, very, uh, he almost always just paints <laughs> clouds. Ray, who is a watercolorist and watercolor clouds are really difficult, but she's one of the masters at it. And then Ian Fisher, who is a remarkable Canadian, also from Nova Scotia, now lives in uh, Arizona. These are huge paintings. And look at that, that is just phenomenal. I mean, that seems really easy, but this is paint, this is oils. And then of course, a lot of uh, like Marguerite, uh, pretty strange kind of clouds. He liked to play with clouds and play with our mind, but he of course, illustrated um, this kind of Dadaism, Dadaism, and still infects us in many ways. Linda Appa, who is a very successful kind of uh, romantic painter and children and beach scenes, but very good at clouds and loves the clouds. And then uh, this gentleman, who's just remarkable, a Scotsman, uh, Mr. Bush, uh, this I, has a feeling for Scotland all over it when I look at his paintings. He was born in Edinburgh, and so uh, you can see this very easily. Paul Norwood, who grew up in Maine, very kind of, he's a palette kind of painter. He just slabs it on, but it, it makes a very interesting effect. Now lives in Mill Valley. And lest we forget, when we think of Ansel Adams, we think of landscapes, but what's a crucial part of a landscape? Look at these clouds. And you may remember Maggie, one of Brian's friends who lives back here, I think in Georgia herself. 
Uh, these are kind of photo montages, but uh, look at the clouds in them. And then there's lots of people who love to play uh, either experimentally or even just uh, manipulating things. This is a Dutch artist. And we have so many of these. <laughs> when we go back, this is obvious Marguerite, all of these. And I, I, I wanted to title this Your Head in the Clouds. And I think it's a good place for them to be. I love this. This looks like clouds, by the way, but it isn't. That's a breaking wave. And this is a body surfer facing into the wave breaking on her. You can see the ripples. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, recently in uh, on Governor's Island, uh, a, an architecture firm put together this uh, clouds, have, our head in the clouds. This is all made out of water bottles uh, with some dye in the middle and you can walk through and so on. Paradolia. Uh, to me, this is my definition. It's a neurological and imperative to interpret an ambiguous visual stimulus or sound, sound into a meaningful image. You cannot, if you're normal, <laughs> you cannot help but see images. You cannot help but see faces in this. And it's fun to play with this. Some people can't. They have some unusual feature about their parts of their brain. But we love to play with this and we love to make things. Uh, the flat earthers who don't believe the earth is round. Uh, this is a picture taken early on in the exploration of Mars. And they're convinced this is a monument to a past, <laughs> past civilization because look, that's a god of space. But when you look at it, I'm, I can't see it, but if you look at it, you'll see it's just really under different light. It's just a, uh, a mountain on Mars. And there is another condition called uh, apophenia, which just means you make connections between weird things and you make some meaning out of those connections. And that's what a lot of conspiracists do. This was Beverly Doolittle. She was popular for a while and played with pareidolia. <laughs> And at the base of our brain, this is underside of our brain, and this is the uh, temporal and parietal lobe. And this area, not, I mean, it's not really distinct, uh, but it's an area that when you see these areas light up, uh, they are, they're lit up by the visual cortex, this lights up and then it goes to uh, both the amygdala, where you'll get emotional feeling, go to the anterior part of the frontal lobe, and even up to the parietal lobe, and you will see a face. So if anything happens to these, then you can't see faces. And some people are born with rosopagnosia, that is an inability because of the damage in this fusiform facial area, uh, or lack of development to be able to construct a face. And so they don't, they use smell, sound, or uh, other feature to identify people, but they're not capable of seeing faces. And also it's, it's a sad condition to me in some respects. Uh, also makes me think of uh, Groucho Marx who said, I never forget a face, but in your case, I'll make an exception. Because of pareidolia, we tend to see faces everywhere. Uh, Elvis uh, shows up in clouds all the time. Uh, and this is just because of our brain making images and faces. There's angel bunny, angels and so on. This is real. This was authenticated, it was taken in Texas a couple years ago. Uh, and why do we associate the sky with heaven and angels with clouds. Well, maybe because we always see them. But there are other things too. <laughs> but angels in particular are things that we 
tend to see, also tend to manipulate. If you look at this one, this is highly manipulated. And so is this one. Uh, but some people say that clouds are a way we can interpret uh, God's messages to us by looking at the angels in the clouds. I wonder if birds see birds in the sky. Anyway, I'm sure they do. I do. That's a distinctive jellyfish cloud, but it sure looks like a little finch. Anyway, keep your head in the clouds, not the crowds.